two presenters, um, Frank and the Maxime uh, here. Frank, um, as you, some of you may know, is a PhD candidate in international relations, um, and he is currently working as a research associate. No, that's good. He's a good working actually as program coordinator for the Middle East Studies program in SIPA. Um, his dissertation is on EU foreign policy, so he's um, one of the experts that I wanted to invite here. And you will tell us more, I guess, about your research in yeah. your presentation. And um, doctor, I should say, Maxime Larivé, got his PhD what, a year ago or something? Maybe 2012. 2012, yeah. From the University of Miami. Um, he is currently working there at a research associate, associate as, at the EU Center of Excellence, basically our branch at the University of Miami, and as an international expert in education for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So that should be quite interesting as well. Um, you know me, I'm currently um, the, the acting director of the EU Center, while Rebecca Friedman is on, on sabbatical leave. And as such, I welcome you. And um, I prepared actually this little handout for you because I'm sure that some of you may not be all that familiar with EU foreign policy. Christine, if you want to hear more. Um, so if you have here that table, I don't want to go through all of that, but I underlined sort of what I thought would, was, were the most important chronological developments of EU foreign policy, right? So if you look here in the 50s, I don't know if you refer to it, and, but in the 50s you had first the European defense um, community? community, exactly. That, wasn't, that didn't get through the French National Assembly, as you can see in 54, and after that they basically established the EPC, or European Political Cooperation, right? Cooperation, coordination, cooperation. Pretty much an intergovernmental periodical meeting of the um, foreign ministers to, to talk about issues of common concern. But since at the early 50s there was this, uh, this doesn't seem to be an appetite for more integration for the longest period of time, there was just really um, very loose intergovernmental cooperation. And you can see there are all these different details. The, the major development happened in 1992 in the Maastricht Treaty when um, the Common Foreign and Security Policy, also called CFSP, Common Foreign and Security Policy, was established as a separate policy pillar. So, um, however, an intergovernmental policy pillar. That means, whereas other parts, particularly relating to the EU single market in 92, you know, were um, sort of more cohesive, made more cohesive, the Common Foreign Security poli Policy pillar was one separate pillar that um, still consisted in the coordination, as the coordination more than anything else, of the different national foreign policies, but it had then also a speaker, right? And that was, it was to be Javier Solana. Actually, he came in. Also. That was later. That was later. That was that was like yes, sorry. 97, 98, right? Yeah. You can see here where the, the Amsterdam Treaty in 97. What happened in between was that the Balkan crisis occurred, remember? Particularly, the, basically, the Serbian civil war. And that showed somehow the impotence of the EU in those affairs. So the Amsterdam uh, Treaty, as you can see here, created the post of the high representative, sort of a speaker role, to answer Kissinger's call for, if I call Europe, right, who answers? Javier Solana used to be also previous NATO Secretary General, so that was very, sort of a smart text. And then we move forward with the Cologne and Helsinki summits in 99 that created the European Security and Defense Policy, or ESDP, um, in an attempt to be more autonomous and less reliant on NATO, without necessarily competing with NATO. Okay? And then moving forward, you see the first missions, in that sense, were held in 2003, 2004 in Bosnia, and then the other ones. In 2009, the Lisbon Treaty was ratified, and that is important because um, it kind of, what would you say, it amplified the role of the high representative, right? In the sense that, um, well, we have now Catherine Ashton, which you probably have heard of, right? She's the official, I would still consider her a speaker more than anything else, a coordinator of the different national foreign policies. And so whenever there's a crisis such as Syria and Libya, she tries to get the different EU member states at one table. It's not always very successful. So this just to give you a very short chronological rundown. Of it. And um, she's also a vice president of the Commission, so that brings the European Commission and the other side together. The national, national government, at least right. they, they coordinate at some point. Plus, plus um, they should, under her auspices, the European External Action Service was created, which is the EU's communalized um, external diplomatic representation. 
So that's just in a nutshell. I don't know if we now should move on and then or should we just wait? Do you have specific questions just relating to the history of theorism? Um, and you use one person. You seem like you have a question. Well, I have a, a preface question. How let's see, how much do, how diplomatic do we have to be with our questions? <laughs> I think you can just show them, just okay. yes. see um, how the reaction is. What would you say to the lack? Are you going to rip the EU? Or? Um, I'm going to ask. In which case, we'll have to shut off the camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there are certain perceptions that people have had about the EU, particularly, like, for example, when it comes to whether Turkey can be admitted or not, or how much say that Germany has in it, I guess, comparatively. And, you know, all of these kind of stereotypical maybe questions that are kind of running around in the news media. Things that I probably wouldn't bring up if I were directly talking to, um, I don't know, someone who... who represents you. Yeah. Well, but then you can ask the questions. I mean, you know, that's what we're, that's, that's what the workshop is about. Okay. I think I'll probably wait until we see what the PowerPoint is. Oh, okay, perfect. No, 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 no. And there comes Dr. Roy, our co-director. Hello, Dr. Roy. Roy. <laughs> you started already. I am sorry. Well, you know what? I actually did take the liberty to start, but I just basically went through a five-minute history of the common foreign security policy. So, but we didn't want to start with the presentation. Well, that's a short history. I mean, it was a very, very limited history. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. Um, so, may I introduce to you just the ones, the few FIU students that may not know Dr. Rock, Dr. Roy is the co-director of the EU Center at the University of Miami. And I don't even start to put all your publications, so this your publications, because we would not be finished. Yes, perfect. So in that sense, I thank you for coming. Um, and now I would say let's move to the presentations. First, we start with Dr. Maxime Larivé and his presentation on avoiding the demise of Europe, the need for Samago 2.0. And I think you should probably explain what Samago actually right. is, right? Which I hope is right. right. So right. Maybe, and maybe 20 minutes or so. Yes. Yes. We have time for question and answer. Well, uh, first, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for having me here. Uh, my talk today is going to be about the Samalo 2.0, uh, what it is, uh, what is it. Uh, if you go back on this uh, page, uh, table 13, that uh, Marcus gave us, he forgot to underline 1998, which is actually really important. I'm so <laughs> sorry. You know what I was thinking? If I should do it, <laughs> because it's the same as someone else. Yeah. This is the UK and France agreement uh, to the Summit of Declaration of European Defense. That moment, 1998, marked the beginning of the defense endeavor of the European Union, uh, which fell in 1954. That was initiated in 1953 by the French and killed in 1954 by the French for domestic reason and as well for policy reason. At that point, we just, had le uh, we just uh, lost the battle in uh, South Korea in the NBN coup, and we were starting to feel the heat uh, with uh, the decolonization process in Northern Africa. And we felt that at that point, uh, the war in Algeria could take us in a different uh, road. So that's why we stopped this EDC. But 1998 was the creation of the European Defense Policy. And that's my entire argument, what well, we need to rethink uh, that specific policy in order to relaunch uh, the defense endeavor of the European Union. Uh, but my introduction, uh, I think we need to set up some kind of a context. Uh, first of all, is the neighborhood uh, is, in, is on fire. Uh, and that's a fact. Uh, I know my colleague is going to be talking about Russia, but I would look at uh, what we call the MENA, the Middle East and North Africa region, which is really on fire since the Arab Spring of 2011. Uh, we've been very much involved there. And this neighborhood, you need to keep it in mind because uh, that would explain a part of my argument. The second element is the U.S. retrenchment. American foreign policy is changing, especially since Obama was elected, where he said, well, we're going to look uh, towards Asia, but as well, we're going to make sure to bring back those troop homes because we need to readdress our foreign policy. And that's been this entire part of American foreign policy literature. Uh, uh, Dr. Parent at UM is extensively writing on that topic, for instance. And the third one, of course, the Eurozone crisis, which is affecting uh, pretty much uh, the money and how much European uh, member states will involved. 
Uh, so in terms of uh, variables and research question, I'm not going to be very methodological, but I want you to see the reflection that's behind my presentation is, uh, in terms of research question, the, the question is, can SMLO 2.0 revitalize the CSDP, the Common Security and Foreign Policy, and empower the EU as a regional power? In 1998, we talked of the EU as an international power. I am downgrading the EU to a regional power. Uh, so uh, the term of regional is very important. And I think in terms of variables, uh, we should look at those two elements, uh, the X1 and X2, which is uh, the European political will. What are European capitals willing to do and invest when it comes to the uh, EU foreign policy and the defense? Uh, if I go back to this chart, in 1998, you can see the UK and France. That was an intergovernmental bilateral decision from Paris and London to actually create a defense policy. So national uh, politics and political will is very important. And the second element, when you keep in mind the US retrenchment and the Eurozone crisis, is this notion of military overstretch. And that's something we've seen in Libya and something we've seen in Mali. And I'll go back on this a little bit later. So. If we look at those two elements, political will or military overstretch is how can the EU remain a relevant regional power you know, with uh, the need and the support of its key member states. And that's pretty much what my presentation is going to be all about. Uh, here, uh, I designed pretty much a simple trial uh, comparing uh, the moment between 1998, the Samalo Declaration, and 2013, which could be the call for a Samalo 2.0. Uh, but the Samalo 2.0 could come at some point because we're going to be rethinking the EU is currently working on this 2013 European security strategy, which is a reformulation of a kind of European grand strategy. So I'm not that far uh, inventing uh, uh, this element. So on the left, you have different elements that I felt very, very important, and I go back to my variables. Uh, the regional context, uh, the balance of power at the international level, the institutional design of the EU, American foreign policy, which could be close to this uh, balance of power argument. And then, of course, the big three, Britain, France, and Germany, uh, the EU, of course, and the European defense. Uh, and here you pretty much have a summary of my, um, my uh, presentation. So the key elements really are this uh, regional context. Uh, 1998, as uh, Marcus said, uh, we had, in the entire 90s, instabilities in the Black Month. We've seen war, really, at the doorstep of Europe, and Europe was absolutely unable to do anything. Uh, we had the war in Bosnia, uh, which uh, we saw the reapparition of concentration camp and all these uh, xenophobic movements. NATO got involved to stop. And then 1998 and 1997, we have uh, 1998, 1999, we have, of course, Kosovo, and NATO got involved again. And at that point, in 1998, when France, at that point, there was uh, President Chirac and Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair uh, decided to sit down at the table in Saint Malo, which is a, a nice little town of France and the Atlantic coast, they were really asking the question what can we do to make sure that Europe can play an active role? in securing the neighborhood. That was all about. But in terms of defense and be free from NATO, meaning we can act when we feel this is really in the interest of Europe. In 2013, we're having the same problem. The Balkans are being stabilized. Uh, Croatia now is part of the EU since July. Serbia may be joining the EU at some point. So the Balkans are not so much a problem. Of course there is tension. Of course the UN is meeting about Kosovo and all that different communities, but the Balkan is not as unstable as it was in the 90s. Now it's really the, the entire MENA region, which is extremely unstable. MENA, it's pretty much starting from Morocco to Somalia. That's this entire branch. And it doesn't include, of course, uh, uh, Palestine, uh, Syria, and all this. Um, in terms of balance of power, very different. Back then, we were under this unipolar system. Today, we are under this multipolar system, even though I know uh, we could discuss, are we really in this multipolarity? I've had this discussion, but I will say yes, we are in this multipolar system. And we can actually see it with the current debate that we're having in this country and the books that are emerging saying foreign policy starts at home. 
so that's one element. In terms of institutional design, we were really at the crossroad. Uh, the CSDP or the ESDP emerged right after uh, Maastricht. Same thing here, we write on this post-Lisbon Lisbon era, uh, where we, we can have this element. And then in, in terms of actors, the big three, they were all active. Uh, France and Britain were active international actors with some kind of relevance, of course. Uh, but Germany was already passive international actor, was trying to figure out what was its role within Europe and even inside Germany, what should we do all together. Uh, in 2013, Britain and France are still active regional power, but with declining and limited power and influence. Uh, we see it, uh, Britain has been cutting all these different spending, and France, uh, it was very difficult for us to uh, launch this small military intervention in Mali without the American. And in Libya, the French and the Brits couldn't do it without the American support. Um, and Germany, of course, I call it this reluctant interventionist, where, you know, I don't even think the word interventionist function on that one. It's just reluctant to be part of any type of foreign policy deal. They call it without me pacifism. That's right. Uh, and so we saw the creation of the ESDP, and now, uh, you know, should we see or should we reflect on this reform of the CSDP? Uh, that's pretty much the same. ESDP, that was the name in, after the, um, after the Cologne uh, summit, and that was changed into CSDP after the Lisbon summit, uh, which incorporates the foreign policy dimension, so it's kind of a, a toolbox. Uh, the reaction of the Americans, uh, this is a, a quick summary. It was not always welcome, this decision for the Europeans to go along on defense. Under the 90s with Clinton, uh, I think the best policy was uh, Madeleine Albright at that point for this peace in the financial time uh, in December 1998, so a couple of days after the meeting in Samalo, and she talked of those three Ds, decoupling, duplicating, and discriminating. And this is all about the protection of NATO. Uh, the American felt that it would be a threat to NATO. So this US approach was by having done this uh, uh, professor in, uh, at uh, John Hopkins, the U.S. approach to the ESDP was actually, in fact, yes, but you can do it, but don't do it. Um, under the Bush era, it really changed because there was a continuation of the Clinton. But in 2006, everything changed with the beginning of the financial crisis, uh, the war in uh, Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and then at that point, you say, okay, maybe we should share the burden. And at that point, they said, maybe you should rethink your CSDP and relaunch the process. And with Obama, uh, the retrenchment and the people to Asia, this has been, you have to do it at that point. Even NATO should not be a backup plan. You need to really invest in defense. And this has been the case with the Secretary of Defense in two occasions telling the, the, the Europeans to get their act together. So I'm not going to discuss this uh, because uh, Marcus already talked about this. But the CSDP has a paper dimension and an action dimension. Uh, that's the paper, all the treaties, um, and uh, this is the action part. So critics say that the EU is not active. That's wrong. The EU has been involved in 29 missions. That's pretty much the map where they've all been involved. Uh, the blue are the civilian mission and the green are the military mission. Because CSDP mission are divided into two sections, civilian and military, and they have different purposes. Uh, the civilian, for instance, uh, this is what they do. Police training, strengthening the rule of law, strengthening civil administration, strengthening civilian protection, and all these fall under this what we call the SSR, uh, security sector reform. And that's what they've been doing. Uh, not always very well, but that's what they've been doing. The most uh, successful mission was, of course, uh, Kosovo. In terms of military, we have only nine missions, and what they do is mostly peacekeeping operation. Military, they've been very soft on this because of the risk he entails. <coughs> All the CSDP missions have been kind of risk-free, and they don't want to create too much pressure uh, domestically. Uh, and even some civilian missions, they try to keep it low-key. For instance, the police mission in Afghanistan that I've been writing extensively on uh, has been very unpopular among uh, Europeans and uh, it's been fully funded and fully supported by uh, European member states. So this is pretty much the CSDP since 2003 because even though it was created in 1998, it became only, we use them on the ground only since 2003. And these are the regions. So you can see most of them 
are in region uh, where France and Britain used to be former pro uh, colonial powers, uh, Africa uh, and the Balkans. Uh, the Balkans, not so much, but the Balkans fit into the, uh, the European, uh, uh, European neighborhood. And this is pretty much the type of mission, so you can see most of them are civilian at, at a majority. And the military, we only have four ongoing military missions. Uh, the rest are uh, completed civilian mission. we are eight as well. So, majority of uh, civilians. What are the limitations for the CSDP? Because yes, it's been involved, but it has been very limited. And I think there's three uh, elements that we can identify in the literature. It's really the capabilities expectation dilemma, or the capabilities expectation gap. That was argument raised by Hills in 1993. This argument wasn't uh, made to tackle the foreign policy question. It was a different institutional element. But pretty much he has the question, and he's trying to study this gap between what the EU says it wants to accomplish and what the EU actually does. And there is a massive gap in between those two elements. The second one, of course, and this goes back to one of my variables, is the political will of EU member states. And we have the big three, especially the big two, London and Paris, leading the way on defense and foreign policy. Germany is on the side. And the rest of Europe, which is actually uh, rising. And this rest of Europe is becoming very interesting when it comes to the future of the CSDP, especially since the beginning of the Eurozone crisis. So what we've seen in Europe in terms of defense is the rise of regional defense cluster, a minilateral uh, defense cooperation meeting. Uh, where we have the rest of Europe uniting into three, four member states in order to identify specific elements. Because what we have with the CSDP is there is no real European interest. What's in the French interest it may not be in the uh, Czech interest or Polish interest. Those uh, cluster of minilateral defense cooperation, like the Bremont Triangle, uh, Visegrad Group, which is the most famous, uh, Benelux Group, and the Nordic Group, They've been tailor tail for each of these group of states based on specific uh, threat and specific spending. So what we've seen is a mini CSDP within the European Union with specific threat and specific spending. And then of course, uh, we've seen a limited commitment to the PNS, which is the pooling and sharing and the European Defense Agency. Uh, in meaning that with the European uh, crisis, we should see, in fact, and that's what the theory fails, deeper integration in terms of defense instruments. That's what we've seen with the 2010 uh, Franco-British summit. Um, but we haven't seen this pooling happening. And this pooling is actually happening within those defense clusters. So there is some that say these defense clusters are actually hurting the CSDP, which is my argument. And some of us are saying, actually not. This is part of this spilling, spillover process that starts from within and then we spill over to the rest of Europe. Uh, but that's different element. And this goes back, and that's pretty much the last, one of the last slides I have, to this element of political will, because I think that's one of the most important. Uh, Sidelining the CSDP. With the Arab Spring, we've seen uh, the region going in flame. And the last two key missions, the European Union wasn't there. Uh, Libya, the EU wasn't there. NATO was there. And Mali, the European Union, was not there at all. That was a French mission sponsored by the Americans for intelligence gathering and transportation because that's what we're very weak at. We don't have that many drones. And the, 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 the airplane, the A400M, was not ready and it's finally getting ready. So in Libya, what we've seen, uh, UN resolution sponsor and pushed by the French and the Brits and the UN uh, gave the authorization to NATO to implement this no fly zone. That was sponsored by the Americans, what we call leading from behind. The European Union said yes, we're going to develop a uh, EU4 Libyan mission which will be a, C a military mission. Well, this is called the Ghost CSDP mission. It was really on paper but was never deployed and it was kind of a shame for the European Union. It's only in 2013 that the EU has de uh, deployed this EBAN uh, Libyan mission, which is just a civilian border assistance mission. And we can see with the latest uh, problems of spread of weapons within uh, the Sahara region, or even the number of illegal immigrants towards Europe that... Uh,
they're not doing enough because the budget is too little and the mission is way too small. In terms of Mali, what we call the Operation, uh, Operation Serval, um, the EU came only after the fight. They, never, they were never involved in the fighting. Only the French troops were doing this. And the EU sent what we call the EUTM Mali, which is uh, pretty much the same kind of mission that they're doing in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, which is training of Malian armed forces. But one of the key problems is how can you train armed forces without a clear state? Uh, that's pretty much the chicken egg uh, dilemma. Can you create a state, with, uh, a state with armed forces without a state? Or do you have to start from the state to create uh, armed forces? So both missions, really, uh, the Libyan and the Malian mission, are a total failure for the European Union because they were missions that were made, uh, there were mission, CSDP type mission. Those missions were for the European Union. They were limited, small, and accessible because they weren't far from the European Union. And that was one of the key problems. So these are four elements. Uh, MENO, one of the key uh, author on the topics, uh, the CSDP has failed uh, to deliver because of limited capabilities, material contribution, political will, all the elements I talked about. Zaki Lady, which teaches at Sciences Po, talks about this uh, European Union and the power avoidance, where the EU is always scared of taking too much power, uh, or whatever he says and means. And over in uh, his uh, kind of interesting piece in 2012, after the Libyan mission, they say, oh, maybe we should not just see SDP within it. But that was just a thought, but maybe it's right on this. Um, so this is my last slide in terms of a decision and in terms of going back to my uh, original argument. Uh, does the Samalo 2.0 make sense, and will this solve the problem? That's the big question. First of all, I would argue, and that's been the case with the EU, bilateral meetings tend to be more efficient than 28 members uh, meetings because everybody wants to bring some different elements. So I think we need to define key elements. The key condition will say, well, I think we need to uh, have a very relevant regional and even international strategy. What is the role of the EU? And this goes back to this element. What should the EU do and what is the EU good at? Obviously we're not good at fighting wars because that's not what we are. And that's not what the CSDP was done. But the CSDP could, with uh, good spending and uh, human capital, be good at the SSR, security sector reform. It could be very good at fighting terrorism, which fit within this SSR, which is strengthening of the state structure of the police and the security structure, which is jails, uh, judiciary system, and the army. And of course, a commitment to maybe a real policy to MENA. So far, they only have a strategic policy to the Sahel region. I think we need to create really an overall strategy, because a strategy is just an overall idea of how we're going to behave. And then from that, we can identify key and uh, very specific policies. Uh, but, and in a worst case scenario, military intervention should be an option if needed, as it was the case in Mali, because even the Americans were very happy that the French went in Mali in order to stop the rise and the spread of this hacking uh, movement, the terrorist movement. Um, I guess I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to make some comments now, or should we first have Frank? Oh yeah, Frank, please. So, sorry, yes, no problem. Yeah, can you please? No, it should be fine. Yes, okay. So just press press four. Makes sense. Okay. Um. Yeah, uh, my talk actually kind of dovetails a little bit with uh, Maxime's in the sense, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say Maxime is negative or, or, or has or pessimistic, but there is definitely EU foreign policy ha and security policy has challenges today. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the challenges it has in its neighborhood. Okay, and I'll define what I mean by neighborhood shortly and how the EU but Maxime mentioned the EU as a regional power, which is kind of sad because they had aspirations of being a world power, or at least a great, not a great power, but a power that made a difference on the international scene. And 
now we're really involved to, to looking at the region where it can still have the most impact. But even there, we'll see uh, shortly, I question that as well. So I'm going to look at that. I'm going to look at three areas, um, both geographically and topically, uh, that the EU currently has challenges. And first and foremost is Russia. So I have Putin here. Uh, the second one, we'll take a look at basically what Maxim identified as MENA, the Middle East and North Africa region, the southern part of the neighborhood. So we'll look at Syria and we'll look at the Arab Spring. So, okay, so I'll start off uh, just in, just kind of frame, have a little bit of a theoretical framework. Uh, we'll start off with a research question, very simple. And this is what I'm looking at. Does the EU still matter? I'll look at what kind of power the EU is. We'll look at the neighborhood in terms of being the primary stage for EU foreign policy and security policy as well. And we'll look at some of the challenges in the neighborhood, Russia, Syria crisis, and the overall Arab Spring. Uh, what kind of power? Okay, so the EU has been, it's a different sort of actor in international relations. It's hard for IR theorists to put a handle on it, to put a hand on it, figure out what the hell it is, right? It's sui generis is the, often the term, because it, it is of by itself. The term is black, it comes from itself, right? It's not a state, it's not an international organization, but it's somewhere in between that. Some, somehow it has, uh, you know, it has the, some of the basic hallmarks of those uh, actors, but not quite, not completely. So it's a little bit of a hybrid. How it presents itself to the world, and this is something that go to Brussels, it's something that constantly is being discussed. You know, in a sense, it's how it projects identity for you know, outside external identity. So, so this idea of, and this is a term that you never hear American academics use, it's awkward, but you hear European academics use all the time, and that's actorness. And, you know, I've been at conferences, and they're like, you're in the U.S., and they'll be like, well, what, what is actorness? But the Europeans use it all the time. And so I'll, I'll go with it. And it's it, and that idea of you know just how it acts on the international state stage. Qualitatively, it's different from traditional states. You know that. And so this is a continuing problem for IR theorists. So how we conceptualize the EU as an actor, this problem has generated lots of academic debate. Um, so let's look at some of the hallmarks, some of the basics uh, of how it's been looked at. And we can start off in the 1970s, this idea of the EU being a civilian power. And that comes from in the early 1970s, Francois Duchesne's idea of civilian power. It simply means it operates because it doesn't have military capabilities of, uh, of itself. Obviously, member states have military capabilities, but the EU itself does not. So it operated as a civilian power. It has to do things without the military option. And that, you know, and for about a decade that went back and forth, probably more, more than a decade, probably for two decades, and we even had people like Edley Bull in the English school trying to figure out, well, how do we label it? It's definitely not a traditional military foreign form, form policy power. Well, for early in the 2000s, you have a British uh, IR person by the name of Ian Manners who comes up with the idea of normative power. He basically takes the, the, the sum of Paul Marceau, the shame's civilian power, but it makes it a little bit different. And this is it's not the EU's only lacks of military, and that's how we define it, but that it acts differently in terms of the international state. It uses norms, it uses values, it uses uh, ideas to affect structural change uh, to the international system. It leads by example, or it's supposed to, and it has soft power attraction. And even more recently, we've talked about it as being a, a transformative power. It looks to structurally change the international system. Now, you can question how much that is true during a time of economic turmoil. There's no thing, so particularly the euro crisis. All right, and in foreign policy itself, you can look at two contemporary conceptualizations of foreign policy. The idea of the traditional dominant Dominant traditional foreign policy, you know, state oriented military security, diplomatic uh, intercessions with crisis and conflicts, 
and just standard day-to-day -day relations between states. Okay. That's, you know, and you could label any state as, as having a traditional foreign policy. Now, the EU, we, we would say, is a structural foreign policy actor. Conducts uh, foreign policy over the long term. Seeks to influence and shape sustainable political, legal, social, economic, security, and mental structures. Okay. And this is really key. The, the idea in terms of when you're looking at the neighborhood, this is exactly what the goal, the strategic goal, if you will, of the EU is to have create security and stability in the neighborhood. And again, this goes back to the experiences of the 1990s in the Balkans, where, which basically terrorized uh, you know, the traditional Europe in terms of having that instability and that kind of uh, fire, so to speak, right at its borders. So very, very quickly, this feeds into the idea of CFSP. Okay, so let's talk about the neighborhood. What are we talking about? Basically, geographically, we're talking about the circle right, around the EU, right? From Belarus and Ukraine in the east through the Caucasus into Turkey, Levant, and then through North Africa. Uh, blue, there's the, I guess that's purple. Yeah, I'm not color I guess that's purple, right? That That is part of what today we, all this is part of known as the Eastern uh, Neighborhood Policy, these countries right here. The purple are in particular known as the Eastern Partnership countries. Okay? This is the North African the Southern uh, Partners. The ones in green, you might wonder if you recognize that's Turkey, and Balkans, they're not considered neighborhood because they're considered what? They're considered possible members, future members of the European Union. So I think that the chart already has Croatia on there. It's blue, right? It's, okay, so it's updated. So but you, there you see Montenegro, excuse me, Bosnia, Montenegro, Serbia, and the other Balkan states, and Turkey. Okay. And um, so the neighborhood, the primary stage of the EU foreign policy. Wow. All right, so what, the key goal for, uh, for EU foreign policy is stability at its borders. To create this stable, uh, secure, prosperous, hopefully, hopefully democratic states around the EU. Now, I won't, get, I won't delve into, but since 2004, they've had a European neighborhood policy. And it's a foreign policy tool used uh, by the EU to affect change in the neighborhood. So it seeks to, uh, it seeks to tie states in the south and the, and the east. Uh, through trade and market access. And there you see the various ways it does that, through association agreements and PCAs. We won't go into what exactly those means. They're very technical. In exchange, what did it, obviously in exchange for trade, but also in exchange for things like democratic reform, economic reform, a human rights dialogue, and the beginnings of good governance to affect change in, in those areas. But very important to the EU. And they're all based on conditionality. Strongly, again, strongly structured. Conditionality means if you want entrance into our large market, we want to see some changes. Okay. And the EU was very successful in the, in the uh, late 90s and or the 2000s to do that to Eastern members that became part of the European Union, like places like Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, and Hungary, and so forth, the Baltic states. It was so, so successful that it was able to structurally change the Okay, EU maintains close ties with the box. Oh, so I'm going to talk about right now Russia under Putin and, and the relationship between the EU and Russia. Uh, traditionally, the, the Mo Moscow and, and Russia have been probably the EU's biggest uh, target in terms of foreign policy, um, in terms of its neighborhood, because obviously Russia stand, stands right there just outside of its neighborhood. So it's a key actor in the EU's foreign security policy. It's, it's had different agreements through the, currently they're operating under the EU-Russia Strategic Partnership based on a PCA, which is a Partnership and Cooperation Agreement signed in 97. Just recently, Partnership of Modernization in 2010 seeks to reinforce the dialogue with rule of law. And they have EU-Russia summits twice a year. Traditional EU foreign policy is twofold. Trade, you know, this by the way, Russia, uh, the EU is Russia's largest export market. So the 
the EU is very important for Russia and vice versa. Trade and almost all of this, not quite all of it, has to do with energy in the form of uh, gas, natural gas, liquid gas. So trade is important. And the other thing that the EU looks to do is to foster democratic reform and, and, and to uh, hopefully affect human rights change. Reality is the EU foreign policy has been failed in this respect. Russia uses its energy resources as a political uh, weapon. You see this in its relationship with the European Union and particularly with the neighborhood. The countries just west of Russia, like the Ukraine, Belarus, uses it as a political weapon to, to have them um, toe the Russian line, so to speak. The impact on dem democratic reform and human rights has been quite limited. Short, -time, short term gains override promotion of values. Many EU states have strong economic, economic and energy ties with Russia, Germany, UK, Italy. So, what you have, in effect, you have two levels of, of foreign policy going on. EU foreign policy, which is very normative and structural, but then you have, at the same time, you have the member states cutting separate deals with Russia, and of course, what does Russia do? They don't pay attention to the EU, rather deal bilaterally with the individual European nations. So this idea of coherence in common foreign policy is out the window quite often with Russia. All right, Putin sees Russia as a sovereign great power, cares very little about the EU, and its normative agenda sees the EU as a competitor for influence in former Soviet space west of Russia, that neighborhood area, and actively minimizes EU influence domestically and in the neighborhood. This has led to a deterioration of political relations between the EU as interests and values diverge. Okay. This impact's been twofold domestically, the hard stance on civil society. You know, we, could, we could spend an hour just talking about what Putin has done in terms of laws and how they affect human rights in. In Russia, and also how it restricts and eliminates civil society organizations. For instance, there are, are if you're a civil society organization in Russia, and you get any money from externally from Russia, you know, let's say it's Amnesty International or whatever, you're deemed a foreign agent, and because of that, there's a whole law that restricts your ability to work in Russia. So very, very punitive in terms of civil uh, civil society organizations. So this restricts progress on modernization of governance. Uh, and for Putin and the Russian government, it's more about focus on modernization of industry rather than governance. Then there's the neighborhood. The, uh, the, the impact on the neighborhood is the grand design to destroy the EU's eastern partnership. Uh, we see this just recently, last month, that Armenia, which was supposed to sign a, a new association agreement next month in Lithuania and in, in Vilnius, where all the Eastern Partnership countries are gathering to sign new agreements with, uh, with uh, the EU. Armenia suddenly decided last month that they weren't going to do it. They told the EU, we're not going to sign. They're not going to sign because Russia put a heavy hand on them, basically restricting and playing economic uh, extortion in terms of, of energy resources and all kinds of trade. So they, they're basically forced to put the Russian line. What's Putin doing? He's trying to create a Russian neighborhood policy, his own Russian neighborhood policy, and create a, a, what he calls a Eurasian Union, a customs union, which only Russia and Kazakhstan and Belarus are a part of right now. So it's a zero-sum game here in terms of what that's developed between the EU and Russia, a real geopolitical struggle between the two. The greater hold Russia has over these states, the uh, more vulnerable pro-Western democracy movements become and direct impact on the EU's goal of having a vibrant democracy to the East. What can the EU do? There's a couple things. Domestically, it's going to be very difficult for the EU to have any real impact on, on Russia as, as situated. But it can focus in on some of the instruments it does have. Again, economic and political conditionality, engaging Russia uh, in human rights. It does that now, but it does that in the guise of these EU summits where most of the time, they're talking about trade, and human rights only gets a little bit of talk, uh, and that's caused a lot of consternation in civil society groups in Brussels, going constantly talking about that. So they want to, if Russia wants to, if the EU wants to affect change, they need to deal with Russia one on one and separately on human rights. They need to increase support for Russian civil societies, and they need to open up the visa programs for Russian visitors. 
allow Russian visitors more entrance into the EU and vice versa to really spell some of the notions that Putin puts out in terms of Europe. In a neighborhood, they need to ensure that all the uh, association agreements are signed with the Eastern Partnership uh, Summit in Vilnius next month, even if it means they haven't met all the preconditions. They have, this is the time that the EU has no better, more leverage on these countries than now. After the, uh, the summit, they're going to continue to use leverage to, to Russia. Russia repercussions, re, re, there'll be Russian repercussions toward the EU, but the EU can withstand it, and it will only be short term because Russia, again, cannot afford to totally exile the EU because, again, it's the largest export market for Russian goods, including uh, uh, petroleum and gas. All right, I won't get into this at the same time. We'll talk about the four concrete steps that's on my slide. Just real briefly, uh, uh, Syrian crisis. Officially, the EU has supported a political solution since the beginning of the crisis two and a half years ago. That's done very little, if nothing, to, uh, to come up with a solution other than saying it supports a political solution. This is troubling because Syria obviously isn't in its neighborhood. And again, it's a prime area where the EU should be involved. More recently, as back proposals for, Syrian, for Syria to give up chemical weapons, we see that last month. But the EU involvement needs to go beyond just chemical weapons incident. It needs to get in there again and uphold its normative uh, power characteristics and effect change where possible. Just like Libya in 2011, Syria has uh, illustrated the pleas of a common action by EU members. And we won't get into all of them, but you can see the UK was involved and in, because of the uh, voting the House of Commons, they pulled out. France continued to support a military option. Germany, as uh, Maxime referred to, was very reluctant. In fact, uh, basically would not support a military strike. So in the Netherlands, Poland didn't even want to listen to it because they didn't think they had relevant military capabilities. Italy, Spain, and Belgium, basically they were waiting for the UN. So you could see very little coherence in terms of Syria uh, as a EU response. Main problem, and, and again, uh, I've seen people this out, there's a lack of political will. Has allowed, basically, the, the EU has allowed the US and Russia to determine the response to the Syrian crisis. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure why this is starting automatically, but let's, let's go over with this. Real quickly, take two minutes. A revolutionary event, uh, the Arab Spring is an evolutionary, revolutionary event on the EU's doorstep to the Europeans, comparable to the end of the communist regime in Eastern Europe. Why? Because it does three things. It ends this idea of an Arab exception that many Europeans held in terms of the proposition that democracy and human rights are not applicable in Arab and Islamic countries. Okay? Demonstrates the value of new technology, of social networking, and undermining authoritarian regimes. And it challenges both political scientists and practitioners to work out a feasible uh, political reform strategies for bridging transitions between authoritarianism and sound democratic but all this is translated into gloom and doom for, the, for what we call now an Arab winter. Fear that Tunisia has become the lone star rather than the leading star. Okay, multiple factors, harsh, what's happening in Syria. The step back we've recently seen in Egypt with the Morsi government being replaced, and we, don't know, we still don't know what that is going to happen in Egypt in terms of the government and government and the army. The growing fear that nuclear proliferation in the Middle East and the general uncertainty over the political events in the region. And the sense that the region might not democratize anytime soon. So, EU's response basically been criticized as reacting, not reacting very rapidly or effectively. Valid, yeah, I'll skip that part, but in practice, in the EU, in the region, the EU has acted precisely in the opposite manner. In manner. Instead of promoting the Arab Spring and helping it, the Arab Spring has occurred despite and that's because the EU, and, it, and very embarrassingly, many of the member states had connections and relationships with a lot of these authoritarian regimes in, in, in the Arab world and in North Africa. And so they were very hesitant, as, as national interests play out, to, again, to have a common response that would help forward the Arab Spring. Okay, response has been marked by recognition that previous policy paradise has been overturned, and basically, some of the items there, but basically they, 
they re to respond to that, but a year and a half ago, they redid what they call the southern part of the uh, European neighborhood policy, and that is to bring more. Sorry about that. I just got that last point. Uh, several elements are in a revised EMP uh, in May 2011. Strong political conditionality push for democ democ democracy and change, but with a greater incentive. This more for more, as Ashton calls it. New tools for democracy promotion. And there's an emphasis that Ashton talked about when she went to the Brookings Institute about a year ago, talking about the Arab Spring. The three M's money, markets, and making Europe more attractive as a model for, for the Arab Spring. And of course, that, you know, how much, is, how much can that be when Europe in itself is in a crisis economically? Uh, I'll leave it at that, at that right there. There is an emphasis more on conditionality, and they need, they need to use the interest in, of conditionality. Because the, let's face it, the EU's main power attraction is its large market, wealthy and educated. And that's the only real instrument that they have that they can use as an instrument of change. Thank you very much, guys. I would suggest that, Dr. Roy, that you are now providing some comments on the, your experiences as well, maybe as on the presentations. I also have some comments. There are more questions than comments, but I'll, I'll wait. And then I guess I'm sure, or I hope that you all have some questions and comments as well. I apologize. If you want to come in late,
jump then into the subtitle or title of the uh, paper to lead into some sort of uh, not the response to you but uh, avoiding the demise of, uh, of Europe. Uh, I think that we are fighting against uh, a wrong perception of both the Europe and the European Union. society.
that's the that's the weak point. That's what the European Union is fighting, is fighting, uh, is fighting against, and that is the threat. That is the, the threat. That is the challenge, because that internal uh, tensions produced by uncontrolled uh, migration is what right now is causing. That's the reality that fortunately that European civilization, you know, that it was in danger of being totally destroyed, you know, uh, in, in World War II, is still there. The European mm -hmm. Union is a different thing. You know, it's, it, it's a volunteer association of sovereign states. And unless we, uh, we keep that in mind, we make that constant mistake of expecting that entity superstate with all the trappings of, uh, of, uh, of a global state. So it would not be, uh, let me finish with this, uh, I'm not seeing that for you because you will have the culprit of placing in the web uh, French soldiers with the, the EU label. And I let you do it. Yes. <laughs> well, that's exactly the idea. You know, you know instead of demanding something to military in the European Union, why not come to terms and say, all right, the British can act, you know, provided they have the label. Of course, the British will not do that. Okay, so France, Italy now, helping Italy, you know, to, to make that uh, actually Congress uh, together, make that decision of reinforcing the power of the you know, to protect the board, not to protect, but to channel, you know, all those powers and we recognize that uh, if the British, the French, uh, the Spanish uh, you know, act like this, they are acting as a European Union too. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, we are asking uh, uh, too much. That's uh, about it. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, shall we open it? Before you answer, should we open it to questions and comments from the audience, please? If you have any, I'm sure you must have some questions, diplomatic or not. <laughs> yes, please, Karen. Hopefully, this is <laughs> um, this is directed toward both Mr. Uh,
So both of you are talking that, to an extent about the European Union failing, whether it's within just this framework of the CSDP or, um, I guess, overall. And the question I have is, is this based exclusively upon this, uh, is this based exclusively because the EU is not intervening? Or is it because it is not agreeing? Or what? to rethink it in such a way that it could actually work in the advantage of um, the member states. Because it's true, it seems from London and even different uh, regions in France, uh, that Europe is the problem to everything. But I think that's the wrong approach uh, to that element. Uh, you know, my different variables on the economic crisis, I think this is a very important element. Uh, Europe and the European Union is very hard. And if France, London, uh, you know, Varsovia and other capitals want to be involved in world affairs, and especially in the neighborhood, the EU is the best platform for that. So it makes no sense except the election uh, element, but now, now nobody votes in Europe. Uh, so in France there is usually 63% of abstention rate, so I don't know how much you're going to upset the electorate. Do you mean the European election? Well, even French elections. In the last election in the south of French, where the Front National was elected, it was 63% of people abstained. They didn't show up. Now we have a fascist party running uh, the region. Uh, so this is not about failure. This is about rethinking based on, okay, we've been, it's been now 10 years since uh, the first mission of the EU, exactly 10 years. It's been exactly 10 years since the first European security strategy. Now it's time to re-identify because the world has changed a lot. The financial crisis is real. Uh, the US foreign policy is changing and we don't even know what's going to happen next month if the US still be involved in foreign policy. So the EU has all the tools needed, especially with the Treaty of Lisbon, the EAS, uh, Lady Ashton at the head of the EAS. We have the CSTP now. We have the money because in the case of Syria, the EU is the largest contributor of um, assistance and humanitarian help, but we don't have a foreign policy. So why would you give money without a clear strategy? So that's why it goes down to a reflection to what we can actually do. So that would be the moment. I, I use the term failure, and I use, but I don't mean it in terms of the EU as a foreign policy actor. So I think I use it specifically. Russia. Again, the goal for the, to use um, you know, the goal to have a European neighborhood policy is to affect change and, and to create a stable zone around the European Union. And if you set that up as a goal, then you need to you, know, you need to put in policies and you need to act that way to, to affect change. The problem is you have you have this two level you have the European Union of Brussels. Of you have the national capitals, and they don't work in tandem right now. And a lot of times the national capitals will use the European Union in terms of being the bad cop of you know, talking about human rights, talking about good governance. That alleviates them to, you know, for them, it's for Berlin or Paris or Rome to deal on interests. And because of that, you have a, a dysfunction and you know, opponents, or opponent, but adversaries or partners, whichever you choose, like Putin, take advantage of that situation. 
Now, in terms of the Arab Spring in Syria, there just hasn't been coherence. They have not been able to effectively come with a coherent plan, a commonality that, right? This is, and in Europe, this is what we stand for, and this is our policy. They haven't had that. And it's been erratic. They've, they've, the Mexicans, right, they put a lot of money, and they, but without a policy to drive that, you know, it, it, you're just throwing stuff out there to, to make an impact. And it's not going to work. There's not even a policy within the United States. In England, we saw it, we saw it divided. In France, the same thing. In the US, and things. So, Syria is a very tricky point. So, it's not necessarily that you're saying that the EU should intervene in Syria or in, the, in its neighborhood. It's just that they need to be more coherent and more clearly define their, their policies for the area. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, um, for instance, uh, High Representative Ashton uh, over the summer really uh, made a fantastic foreign policy coup when she met with President Morsi. Yeah. She was the only one to ever met with Morsi. The EU hasn't capitalized on that specific element. We still don't have the Egyptian foreign policy. We still don't have a common position on this. What's happening here? What's the gap? She was the only one. Not even a Secretary uh, Kerry made it, or uh, the French uh, uh, Foreign Minister. Only her. That was a foreign policy coup. Nobody advertised for that one. And uh, what else? nothing has happened since then. Yep, yeah, you go first. Uh, I have a question as well. Just a couple of points that I would like to ask you and that are all related to this. That, was, that you can kind of answer it, but um, with the economic crisis, with the loss of Turkey as a possible member of the EU, uh, with the lack of capacity and effective intervention, because of this mixed sort of foreign policy where the country is put to some to the side and, and, they put, and, and the European Union does, cannot organize the single voice. Is the EU losing its power of attraction? That would be one of the questions. Because this all depends on prestige, and when Manning and, and, and other authors talked about the EU was a normative power, we were in the middle of the 90s where everything seemed okay with democracy and nothing seems as an alternative to democracy. We're not there anymore. So what happens to the European power of attraction? which is to be the great, um, the, the, real, the real distinctive characteristic of the EU as, as a power. The second question would be, aren't the goals of the EU sometimes a little too high, which make the countries not be able to, for instance, uh, Frank was talking about the Arab Spring, and he suggested somehow that the EU should point to the democratization of the Arab world, where nothing indicates that that would happen, not because of being Arab at all. I totally reject the argument that because there is no tradition of democracy, uh, because we didn't see any real signs that would indicate that the states were going towards a democratic, a real democratic process. Nonetheless, both the European and the United States look at that as a goal. That looks to me very unrealistic. And, and another example is uh, try to enforce Russia or try to create conditions for Russia to uh, have another approach to human rights. What we are seeing in this, at least since 2000 is a totally opposite sort of direction. So in those kinds of things, does not the EU have two higher goals? And another just very, very short comment is it, somehow will happen because there was a military failure. The EU needed to actually use military force to resolve a problem in the Balkans. And what we are seeing now is that, as, as Maxime uh, referred several times, we have this, this Middle East that actually invites Europe to do something in, in a military way too, and the EU is not capable of it. So if this is also a military crisis. Why do we never talk about military interventions when we talk about the EU 
and always about uh, uh, values. So I mean, this would be comments. Well, I, I'll talk about the uh, loss of uh, power and traction. That, that's, that's evident in real life. Is it a permanent state? I don't know. But it, it definitely in the last three or four years because, because we're, as a normative power, the, the idea is to put yourself out as a model. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think Manners mentioned it's not what the EU is, but how it, what it does. Okay, so the world sees how, you know, during the, at the Euro crisis, the consternation in Europe, the, the protests. So they're able to point, well, you don't have your house in order, so to speak. So they, they lost a lot of power of attraction because of that, because of that in many places. So, and in terms of EU2 higher goals, remember, it sets itself up. I mean, if you go to Brussels and you talk to me, that's exactly what, because they don't operate in, in a traditional way. They don't, they don't have the ability to project militarily in, in a common, in, in an EU common thing. So they have to, well, they've chosen to be a structural form policy operator. And because of that, their goal is long term. Okay. So when they're when they're when they talk about democratization in the Middle East or in, in Eastern Europe, the Eastern border, I can't call it Eastern Europe because the Eastern Europe is now part of the but with places like Belarus and Ukraine, there they have, it's a long term goal. So they have to work with one of the first things they they they, they claim that they need to do, but very often if they don't follow through, is this idea of working with them and trying to promote civil society organizations. You know, this idea that you have to start with, with, with the society before you could create a democracy. The Europeans are familiar with that and they're very, they understand that. But they have not committed to it in, in terms of their rhythm. So that's that's where there's a disconnect. They talk a lot about it, but in reality, you know, and especially when you're running a two-level foreign policy like Brussels and National capitals become very important. Um, I guess it's like all the civil one military intervention of the EU. Look, there is a lot of element to explain it. it. It is a fascinating topic in the sense that this Arab Spring or Arab Winter represents the greatest security threat to the European Union. No problem. But for most member states, they do not perceive it as a threat. Uh, why is not certain, but the threat is there. We've seen it with this massive migration through the border of Turkey, Greece with this uh, Eurozone, uh, with this uh, problem, cannot protect the border of Turkey, doesn't want to protect it. So that's another point for the uh, for Europe. Uh, then we have as well those um, immigrants uh, uh, going through the Mediterranean and a lot of them dying. And uh, of course, if you have the region becoming extremely unstable, like in the MENA, much more in the middle, in, uh, in Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Somalia, this will impact trade, this will impact proliferation of nuclear or small weapons, this will impact drug trafficking, by the way, or drug cartel passing by. Uh, the Sahel region to have access to the European market. We're talking of core human security issues. But for some extent, for some reason, this is not perceived uh, in the capital as a great threat to the Union. Uh, so that's very interesting. So this goes back directly to the political will, right? The EU cannot stop the military mission on its own. That's not the way the, the treaty was designed. And uh, you have to go through the 28 member states and they have to decide what we're going to do, what are the problems, how much money we're going to invest, how many people we're going to send. And this is thought as well about national prestige because if it goes well, you want to take your credit as a nation state, but if it doesn't go well, uh, you know, you want to blame the EU. That's one way. Yeah. <laughs> then, then it's a political gamble at the national level. Uh, I think the most obvious example was the Afghan uh, mission. Uh, the EU has been involved since 2007 with this European police mission after the failure of the German 
police training mission that started in 2003. And um, this has been a real uh, problem for uh, member states because can we die for Europe? Is that normal to die for Europe? Dying for France, dying for England, dying for Spain, yes, but can you die for Europe? And that question of you know bleeding for Europe is is really there. Nobody really tackled this because it goes directly to the notion of national sovereignty and state sovereignty. Who should I die for? And uh, so that's another argument. So it's much more ideational dimension, but I think nevertheless very very important. Uh, our French soldier ready to die for the European Union because Poland needed to uh, intervene in this specific region of the world. Uh, and then, of course, the last one, and this goes back to money, is coordination and cooperation. Usually, there is duplication of capabilities. So, yes, we have a lot of airplanes, but we don't have aircraft carriers. Uh, we have no helicopters, and we need this. And then we don't have uh, drones for intelligence gathering, uh, but we have a lot of other elements. So, and right there, there is no cohesion within the union to actually have a way of plan on thinking about how, do, uh, how, can we do, uh, how can we fight all together into one cohesive army. Of course, it's difficult. 28 member states, 28 armies, 28 cultural of war, 28 national identity. The, the, it's, it's a very demanding element. So that's why I think we need to re-identify a clear strategy that we all agree on. Because to join the EU, there is the Copenhagen criteria. We do believe in specific elements, so there is common ground. Now we need to take that common ground into a specific crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Just, no, uh, I'll try to make a comment and, and you know, provoke a little bit, and I'd like to see your reaction. Um, yeah, so there's more than a concrete question. I have a reaction on my own, and but I, I, I want to put it as a challenge a little bit. Um, Part of, I think, part of the um, argument you're making for a new, uh, you know, sitting down and reframing the security questioning with right, the SMLO 2.0, um, and you know, I want to challenge a little bit the this idea of the neighborhood, the fire in the neighborhood, the idea that all problems come only from abroad, and to minimize a little bit the idea that the Arab Spring or things that happen in Africa are the major security challenge for, for or security threat, but that's how you put it, the threat to the, to the EU. Of course there's change in the context, of course there's migration, but that has been happening since the, the beginning of the EU as a success in economic terms. I mean, but to call that a major security threat, I mean, and then I get to the idea that why would countries uh, that explains what you just ended up, but you cannot agree easily on a common framework of a military framework, security uh, need policy, when you don't have a clear uh, security threat. So, really it's like Joe, Joe Perry would make this argument and other colleagues of his, he would make the argument from a realist perspective, but you don't need to be a realist to make this argument that clearly history has shown that it's very difficult, I won't say it's impossible, it's highly difficult, extremely difficult, to get a 20-something Security Council, because that's what the U.S. is trying to build, right? A Security Council of not just 5 plus 10, but it's a Security, security Council of 2, the U.K. and France. Germany is like in the Security Council for real, it's like in between, the hybrid. But who? Only France and the U.K. are more than 50% of the budget of the Security Defense. There, the, so you say, they had to, 20 people get together and rethink how we're going to do it. On, on the factual uh, table, is that these two people say, are we going to fund it or not? Is this a threat for UK and France first, and then other people bandwagon with us or not? Is the NATO, NATO, when you see the Balkans, is the US military forces? I Iraq, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, who was the actual military force on the field? It was the US making the decisions, like, so the operations on paper looked like that. But at the end of the day, uh, you get you get that uh, probably it's not because they don't want to, because that's a big part of it, but also they can't, without a, a clear objective. Who are they going to build an army against? The EU? Uh, so they, they die from, from their own words, because the whole idea is that we're normative, we expand values. So if you look the part, someone showed the map there, uh, very clearly you see where they are intervening, civilian or not, 
Uh, and that's a pattern of re uh, civilizing areas that were civilized by Europe before. And I use the word civilization because it's part of the argument about the normative power, but it's hidden. So if you transform all these concepts about civilizational power, it's the same. So when you talk about civilian, uh, the, the civilian uh, you know, type group of the society, the, the civil society, that's actually, you want, I want you to be European. I want you to have our values. I want you to have our kind of market, our kind of democracy. Um, so I'm, I'm making this, uh, again, as a provocation. I'm, I feel like a Westerner. I, feel, I very much enjoy the values of the EU. But I'm also from China, so I, I can escape from the perspective. I will look at this stuff from the periphery. And I would say the retrenchment of the US, I also, you, you see the transition from military to civilian operations, right? That's really, that, that part of the part chart, the, 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 the chart was growing, right? I see that as a good development, right? It means that EU is getting weaker. They have less cohesion, less money to fund military e uh, issues. And that means that from the periphery, from your Algeria or any country in Europe, right? Uh, that's a good development for them, right? It's actually uh, letting loose certain constraints, normative and, and more tangible, and you know, giving my own chance to get my own house in order. Because that's a, at the end of the day, that's a big problem for the EU. They intervene in all these very, very peculiarly looking uh, countries, right, in the map, <coughs> because they are the source of the migration. So all this idea about values, that we are exporting these values, actually we are exporting our own into, we want to make states that control there, not here. Uh, you know, they stop the migration there, not here. So the Mediterranean, because of technology and everything, is not a barrier anymore. So I'm, I'm making you know, this, this very, very realistic kind of critique on purpose to, to, to see if sometimes, I know you're French, but could be, uh, no, 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 I, we, we have this difficulty. Where, where are you from? Argentina. We have difficulty sometimes, you know, and getting, breaking with the framework. Of, of how uh, you know the main literature sometimes gives this to us, right? And think about it like it's good sometimes from another perspective that the EU is unable to do most of what it wants, right? Because from the EU point of view, it only makes sense to talk about this if we want the U.S. to be a big player again, and we want the U.S. Uh, to uh, let some, you know, certain countries under the influence of the EU back again. Because what we've seen so far after the Second World War is the retrenchment of French and UK interests and military presence everywhere and replacement of, of that void by the US. You see that, in, you, may, you mentioned, uh, you know, Asia, uh, Vietnam, you see that in Africa with the rebumping of the AFRICOM. So, putting it in a bigger perspective and probably a more crude analysis and it's less rosy and, and from their periphery perspective, it's, it's a happy development. You. Well, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think a uh, civilian mission is a sign of weakness of Europe. is actually not playing the game of the Americans. The Americans tend to solve problems with bombing. Uh, I don't think you saw here, uh, Afghanistan bombing the country for 10 years. They didn't solve the Vietnamese problem for bombing the country for 10 years. They didn't solve the Iraqi problem in going in war in uh, Iraq 1 and then Iraq 2. So I think the civilian is actually targeting the real cause of the problem. If you look at the Balkans, uh, this is a good case scenario. We use military force to stop it. They did stop it. And then the European Union has been involved for 10 years in rebuilding. This is far from being perfect. There is still massive minority violence in Kosovo. Nevertheless, Kosovo is a recognized uh, sovereign state of the United Nations. The, the United States recognizes it. The European Union is kind of contentious still. But this is a state that functions with the help of the European Union, with the help of the special representative over there, and they use the euro as a common currency. The Balkans is not a threat uh, today to the stability of Europe and to most of the minority groups in the Balkans. When it comes to Africa, you're absolutely right. This is in the interest of the European Union to stabilize Africa. How can Europe absorb an entire continent of illegal immigrants? This is not possible. So, and this goes through civilian mission where you develop the basic uh, structure, and that's why I go back to my argument of the SSR. 
I'm a strong believer of DSSR. The problem of DSSR is you cannot do it on the chip, and it takes a long time. Because building a state does not include building a state based on the European, uh, on the Westphalian system, in a society that does not believe in a Westphalian society, or does not have a national identity the same way we have. So we need to identify those elements. But civilian missions are not uh, the end of uh, the European. And then if the Americans uh, want to keep bombing, that Fine, but that just doesn't work. And I think we will go back, I can go back to your argument on uh, Lampedusa, where you say it was a failure, uh, was it the success of Europe? I think absolutely not. Uh, I think uh, this Lampedusa is an illustration of two elements reckless national policies, uh, where France and Britain and the US decided to oust Gaddafi out of the blue when they've been living with Gaddafi for so long, and the French almost providing them nuclear power. And on top of this, it's a failure of the CSDP to play a role in rebuilding Libya. Simply, uh, the EU did not combine enough money, enough men, and the EU BAM or the EU for Libya in order to make sure that the state is stable. Last weekend, the Prime Minister of Libya was kidnapped by his own people. So obviously, we haven't done the job. Gaddafi is gone, we didn't like Gaddafi, but now we end up with a system that's even more dangerous with massive wave of immigrants. So I think we need actually more European and more civilian European mission in order to stabilize the foreign. But the problem is the EU tend to make mission in two year long. We're talking of like 10, 20, 30 year long mission to rebuild the state. How long did it take for the US to become a state? To How long the state that is originally artificial. So and that was my point. Yes. Probably less European Union would be better for the country. Good. You put it as like uh, black and white, right? Or, or bombing of the state or civilizing it again. I have this other, other, other right. options like, uh, you know, close, do a better job closing your own border. I think it's a nasty, but that's, that's in the door of your heart, right? So you, you get the, the massive migration at the shores of Spain or, or Italy. So the, the, the tactic is, I think, of course, it's less. Uh, easy to criticize because it's not bombing people like like Clinton did in the 90s, right? Uh, but uh, it looks much better. It looks nice. I'm I'm good. I'm not Bush. I'm not bombing you. But I'm still doing. Uh, that's my perspective from their own position, right? I'm still teaching you how to be a state, but not according to your own grassroots. Because this idea of grassroots development is actually imposing values and standards that are European. So you're trying to come up to put a state, again, a state that is, was already artificial from the start in the case of Africa. Uh, can I just also, um, yes. did you want to say something? So, so I, I think it's okay to, yeah. I, I, I think in that sense, it's, you know, the EU has the right to have specific Western liberal aspects that they want to bring forward. But I do also agree that, and that's my opinion, that um, you have to be very careful what the EU does, particularly in the colonial powers, because it reeks a lot like, let's call it colonialism for right. what it is, or neocolonialism, right? So I don't understand why we have to go to Congo and, you know, right. work there. Why, why couldn't we be more multilateral in that sense in the EU, EU and while neglecting the neighborhood that is really important for so many strategic, humanitarian, and other reasons, right? And we are suffering there. So, I mean, that's just for way. But I want to also pose a question. Let me just jump on this. Uh, in Mali, when the French arrived, uh, François Hollande was welcomed by the king. Uh, and he was re-welcomed a second time. Uh, the fact is, I, I agree with the colonialism and all these things. Absolutely. This is not what I'm saying. But nevertheless, they need European power in order to fix the European mess that they created 100 years ago. Okay, that was the subject. Yes. And, and I, I just want to think. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of normative power doesn't mean necessarily that it's good. That's my point. Right? Right. Normative power, because if you look at normative power and you define it theoretically, then the U.S. is a normative power. Russia is a normative power. China and India are normative powers. But they, because basically we're talking about interests, too. Mm -hmm. Values, but behind values are our interests as well. So, of course, the European Union is going to deal with its own values, the, the sense of good governance, the good sense of rule of law, which are inherently European, but they don't necessarily are exclusively European. And well, it, it depends. And, and particularly in a neighborhood where, where if there is an influence of Europe, it's been there for millennia.
one, uh, going to Africa and the idea of colonialism, yes, I, I agree. Especially when there's no sense of the West Indian state. Okay, I'm sorry, who is it? The way to say it is that, that I think one way to look at it is to distinguish
I, I want to quickly, um, because we kind of want to close up, just very quickly, if you have a chance, in 30 seconds, I don't know if you want to do one minute mix, um, say something about the future. We talked about some of the analysis of the problem. So given the pivot of the US to the Asia and that the Europeans seem to have to do more, and given the fact that they, however, there's a Euro crisis, they're limited resources, they're reducing their defense budget, rather, right? Um, is there, how do you see the future of a common foreign and security policy? Is there going to be more of the same muddling through, or is there actually other Europeans actually, for better or for worse, right, getting their act together, putting resources together, being more strategic? 30 seconds. I, I thought the, the Euro crisis would be a good impetus for them to finally realize that they need more political cooperation, not just economic and financial, but more political cooperation. And I thought, you know, in the short term, it was going to hurt foreign policy, security policy, but in the long term, it would uh, actually benefit. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, some of the things I'm reading about Europe lately, I, I wonder. I think. I think because the crisis is subsiding, there's a little bit of reversion back to the sense of um, you know, you know, national sovereignty and you know, you know, the idea of muddling through the you okay. Know, and that, and I know a lot of people in Europe, that bothers a lot of people in Europe. You know, that, you know, my research is on think tanks and have to step communities in Europe you know, in terms of foreign policy. That bothers the heck out of me because they really, they were hoping that this would be a window of opportunity get the sense that that's not going to happen. Well, uh, it's the people that really happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first part, uh, because Obama and the U.S. are pretty much dragged in the Middle East, and uh, we'll see. Uh, and then when it comes to Europe, I would tend to agree. Uh, I think this is back to national policies, uh, where foreign policy and defense is not the main topic. Uh, so I think we, we may see this uh, mini cluster type of defense cooperation. Variable geography. That geography I think it makes sense because you know uh, we can agree on specific uh, national interests and specific policies and coordinate with friends, regional friends. So I think that's what we may see in the short term. Do you want to add to that? Well, wait till the sleepwalking giant Germany breaks up. Well, <laughs> 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 yes. to add a commercial, uh, we, we publish those volumes uh, as a result of our conferences and uh, you, uh, people from FIU that I don't know who that sent them. It's fantastic, thank you. You not only get food and drink, but you also get a book. Yes. Thank you. So with that being said, thank you so much for coming and doing the <laughs> There's a lot more that we probably could talk about, guys. Thank you for coming and spread the word. Oh, if you would mention.